All right. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome everyone to um, Gilly training session two. Um, so uh, my name is John Kai. I'm an engineering manager on Giddily. And today we have Karthik Nayak, senior backend engineer on Giddily, and he's going to present on Git internal. So just a two sentence intro, like why? Um, I think knowing the internal data model of Git really helps to know the tool. Unfortunately, Git is one of these tools that has a super steep learning curve. And my experience is I didn't really fully understand what the tool did until I learned the internal data model. A little unfortunate. Um, it shouldn't, you know, tools shouldn't be like that. But, you know, uh, Git is one of these tools. Um, it really helps to know the internals. So without further ado, I will pass it off to, oh, real quick, um, uh, compared to last time, um, so yeah, so in the doc, there's a section for questions. We're going to try to do questions a little differently. We're going to try to do it um, in real time. So I'll kind of be the moderator. And once we have like a couple of, so go ahead and type in your questions, like, yeah, in real time as Karthik is going through um, his presentation and I'll stop him at, at different points to have him answer some questions instead of waiting till the very end. So that's one change for last time. So, all right. So without further ado, Karthik, take it away. Uh, thanks, John, for the introduction. Uh, so as John mentioned, I'm Karthik. I work in the Gitly team. Uh, let me just share my screen so we can get started. Okay, I hope you can see my screen and the font is legible. Uh, just to give an agenda of what we're doing, uh, mostly we're gonna focus on the object structure in Git, how the internals of Git works, and then uh, go through the different scenarios I can think of. Uh, then we'll focus a little bit about the .git folder, which is there in repositories, uh, what do they consist of? Uh, then we'll move on to branches and tags, how do they work? And finally, if time permits, we'll also move into a little bit about pack files and what they are and how they work. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'm going to talk about something that John kind of mentioned, which is the life cycle of a Git user. Uh, there's a nice saying that if you're driving, you don't need to know how to know how a four-stroke engine works internally. That's kind of similar to how most developers treat Git. We know the interfaces that Git provides. We know what tools, it, what the tool does but we don't really uh, worry about how it works internally. And that's kind of the focus of this talk on some level. Uh, but why do we need to know it is because it makes a lot more sense once you start understanding the internals. A lot of these commands, which I have used and most of us have used, uh, is more of like something we know cause and action, but we don't know why. And that this unlocks a lot more because of that. And also debugging becomes a lot easier. Like when you're stuck with something and your repository is in a state which doesn't seem normal, because you know how it works internally, debugging makes a lot more sense now. Uh, with that, we will start with the object structure in Git. Uh, so I'm going to start with a simple repository here. So we'll do a Git in it, and that creates a simple repository. And whatever we do, we'll be working with this repository to just show you how it works. Uh, and this is, there's nothing in the repository right now. And if you see the Git folder, it has all these things which were done because we initialized the repository. Uh, we will go over all of these later, but yeah, that's the base this one start. So what does Git internally? It's, it's something in computer science called directed acyclic graph, uh, which is a fancy term for, it's like a tree structure where there are nodes and nodes refer to other nodes, if you can think of it that way. So in Git, there are three prominent data structures we need uh, structures we need to think about. One is a commit, the other one is a tree, and finally there's a blob. So going from bottom to top, a blob is just a file which contains data. We don't care about the name of the file, the location of the file, nothing. It's just the data that we're concerned about. Uh, then comes the tree. Trees are more of uh, association of how blobs can stay in the repository. So if you have like a directory and subdirectories below that, those are represented by trees. And then the file name of that blob will be represented in that tree. So a tree is overlooking multiple blobs or multiple other trees. 
And finally, a commit just represents the state of the repository at a particular point of time. So if this is a little confusing, we'll start with a simple example. And that should give some clarity about what all of these objects are. So we start with simply creating a file. So I create this file, say foo, which has contents data one. And then from there, we get add. This is what we do to add the file to staging. And finally, we commit that with git commit. So now if you look at git show, it shows that we have this commit c1. And the data in that is data one with the file foo. So now, what does the com commit tree and blob structure here mean? So let's look at that. So if you look at the commit, it gives us a, sh a SHA ID of that commit, which shows the, which is known as the object ID of that commit. So if you want to see the graph of this, we take this SHA ID and get cat file is something which allows us to read the SHA ID. So when I say, can you tell me what this object is, it says, this, the contents of this object is nothing but there's a tree in this object and the author is Karthik and the committer is Karthik. And this is my signature. So, and if you see the git, what is the type of this object? It will tell us that it's a commit. So if, when you see a git show, it's nothing but saying that there is a commit and this is the details of that commit. So now if you want to see this tree that this commit refers to, and if I put this there, so it's saying it's a tree. And if I print that tree, it says there's nothing but an object called foo, which is the name of the file. And this is the blob which associates with that object. So if I go one more step, it says this is a blob. And if you print that data, it says data one. So to give you an idea of this, it's something like this. So there's a commit which has a tree and the tree has the data structure, the blob, which holds the data data one. And the name of that blob, the file part of that blob, which is foo, is kept in that tree, as we saw here. So in this sense, blobs are at the bottom, which hold the data, which is at this space. And then trees are basically structures which hold the directories and the file parts. So if you have subdirectories, that would be a tree within the tree. And finally, commits represent these trees and blobs data structures. So in simple, you might think, how is the blob created? So if you see our blob here, which we printed, it just has the data, which is data one. So if you, for example, at the same time, want to see this in the data structure. So if you see the git and there's objects, this is where git stores all of these objects, blobs, trees, and uh, commits. And if you see this data structure, you will see that there are three objects right now. The first one being the commit, which we printed, 2838. And you can see that 2838. The second one being the tree, which is 006FD, and so on. And the final one being the blob, which is this one. And you might try to like print one of these. For example, like I, try, I printed this blob. And if you want to see this blob, we do git objects 28. You'll see that it's in a binary format. So Printing blobs cannot be simply done by a cat because it's stored in a binary format. So, but there are tools which you can decompress it while, and here, if we do this, you'll see that this is nothing but what we were trying to print as well. So Git takes this information, compresses it and stores it in these files for us. And there are different formats that Git uses. I'm just showing one of these examples so you can see how it works. So we'll also see how Git creates blobs, for example. So we know that the blob should contain this data, foo. And Git has this internal uh, uh, command called hash object. And I'm saying, hey, Git, if you want to create a blob with the data foo, can you tell me what it will be? And this is what Git says. OK, if you want to create a blob with this data, it'll give us this hash. So that's kind of what we had at the start, if you see. Oh, sorry. And we want to do data one instead because that's the uh, file we have. So, And it gives us the same hash that we got from the file that we created. So if you see our 
LSU and we do cat2, which has data one. And the blob for that is the same as if you would do it manually. So Git basically takes the data for the blob, and that's the only input to creating the hash for the blob. Uh, the blob doesn't care about time. It doesn't care about anything of that sort. It just cares about the data. And this, you can take it a step forward. Like if now we have the blob, how do we make the tree? So trees are nothing but simply this format where it says the uh, this is the permissions of the blob, and we want to create a blob type. And let's say the object ID of the blob will be this. And finally, we want to give the name of the blob, foo. That is the file name that we created. And if we supply this to git make tree, it gives us an ID. And this is similar to the ID that Git created for our internal tree storage. And Taking this a step forward, we can also create the commit ourselves. All we need to do is give the information about who is creating the commit. That is the name, the time of the commit, the committer name, committer email, and the time of like all of those information, and which tree is the commit created against. So in our example, if the tree would be this one, which is the one we created, 006F, and it'll give us an ID. This doesn't match the ID that we created for this commit. That's only because I didn't supply the name, the time to be the exact as the one we just created. I hope that gives you an understanding of how uh, commits and trees and blobs are associated. Now we will take this a step forward and see what happens when we add a new file. So we already have one file in our structure, which is foo, and if you see that, Ooh, it has data. Maybe you can pause real quick, um, mm -hmm. give people a chance to write any questions if they have. There is one, um, uh, one question, SHA value is SHA1. We also support SHA CC4 GitLab, if I remember correctly. Uh, do you want to address yeah. that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so currently, uh, it is SHA1 by default in Git. And SHA256 is a new upcoming format which Git is supporting. The idea behind this was there's a collision uh, in SHA-1, which was created, I think, by Google a, few, a year or two ago. And because of this, it was uh, recommended that we move to a more uh, safer hashing algorithm. But Git is built in such a way that SHA-1 is deeply embedded into everything Git does. And uh, we had some patches in Git which moved to SHA-256. And we recently also support this on Gitly entirely, where we say that uh, now you can create repositories with SHA-256. So by default, Git will still use SHA-1. And there is an option while creating, I believe it's, if you look at the man page for Git in it, you can see, yeah, this, yeah. So you can, while creating the repository, you can say object format, and you can say, I want to use SHA-256. And then Git will create the repository in uh, two, uh, 256 format. Uh, I still have an older version of Git which says that this is a experimental. I believe in the recent version they just removed this, where we also enabled uh, yeah, support right. for for this on Git. So yes, and cool. but one thing is to remember is that these two formats are still not interoperable. So it means that if you have SHA one, you can't use SHA two fifty six inside your repository and vice versa. But there is some work being done there to even get that up and coming. Cool, and then um. You you might have co covered it, but then might have been a little fast. Um, just like at, at a basic level, like how does can you explain how Git computes how it gets that SHA like how what it uses to compute the the hash? Right. Uh, so to compute the hash, there are, first it depends on the type of the object. So for different objects, there are, uh, the uh, hashing let's say the algorithm takes in different inputs for different objects. So we know of three objects that we spoke about. One is blobs, or trees, and comments. And for blob, like I mentioned, it only depends on the data. So uh, we, so here, as simple as this. So when we have the data, it takes that data, and based on the data and the length of that data, it creates this uh, hash object for, for blobs. For trees, it is the path of that uh, path of a particular uh, blob or tree, the ID of that particular blob or tree, the type, which is here in this we gave blob, and also the permissions. So this is the input. 
And finally, for commits, it's uh, the commit user's email time and commit author's email time, and also the tree objects that the commit is created against. And I believe also the commit ID and uh, the message in the commit. So all this information is put together, and that you that is sent to the hashing algorithm, which creates the hash. Yeah, and for trees, I mean, you can think of them as directories. So yeah. um, the example Karthik put, that's like a one file directory or a one blob yep. tree. And then yep. trees can have other trees as entries um, yep. in in its data. So Yeah, that, that's cool. Correct. And I think moving on to the few examples, we will cover some of those scenarios where we have multiple different types of objects working together with trees. Uh, awesome. Yeah, let's let's continue. Yeah, so the uh, second one that I want to talk about is when now that we have a basic idea of how this works, so there's a commit, there's a tree, and then there's a blob at the bottom. Uh, what happens if you add a new file? Like, how does that work? Like, does it get added to this tree, which is existing? Is a new tree created? And what happens to the commit structure then? So uh, let's try this out. So we create a new uh, file. So right now we have. Yeah, so we have uh, just foo here, and we uh, send this one, which is new one, which is bar with data two. So if you see here, if I do get status, we can see that there's a new file added. So let's add that file, and let's also commit that with. So now, if you see the log. You'll have two commits, the one we created the first step and the second one. And if you see the second commit, is the recent one, it says that there's a new file added called bar, and the, the contents of that file is data too. So now what is the difference between the previous commit and this? Now, if you see this, and if you want to print the, what is in this commit, for example, so we'll do the same thing. Uh, just to give, uh, just to, I think I didn't explain, but cat file is more of if there is an object in the Git data structure here, the tree object or any object in the Git object folder, cat file is used to print the contents of that object in a human readable format or also to see what is the type of that object. So dash t would give you the type. So if I take this object hash here and say it'll give me it's a comment, and if I want to see the contents, dash p, which is pretty, I believe. So then it says, what is the contents of the chapter? So this commit, which we recently created, it's saying that it associated with this tree, and it also has a parent now. So if you look at this uh, log, you can see that this is the new commit, and the parent is this. Whereas if you look at the old one, where it didn't have a parent, because this is the first commit in the repository. So now this new tree that a uh, new commit that we created has a parent, and this is the tree associated. And we can also cat file this tree, and you'll see now it has two blobs. One is foo and one is bar, and that makes sense because now we have two files here. One is foo and one is bar, whereas the tree earlier only had the foo part because there was no file bar. Here. And the good thing you can see that is that uh, the tree that we created before, which is let me just so you can do head, which is the recent. Uh, so get ref parse. So ref parse is used to get the object ID. So if I do get get ref parse head, it shows the object ID of head, which is the same as get. Uh, it's like seeing git show, and you can see the commit ID. So this gives the object ID. So if I do get ref parse tree. It gives the tree associated with this commit. So we can use this to say git cat file dash t, git ref parse head, which will show us the commit, and tree, which will show us the tree. And finally, I want to see one commit before this. And if you see the tree of that one, it only has one file. Whereas uh, the new one has two files. But the cool part is that. The foo that was created has the same hash as the foo here. That means for existing blobs, it does not recreate them. And you can see that in the object structure. Uh, there were three objects at the start, and now a few more got added, but this one is still the existing one, which was previously there. So uh, This solidifies that Git kind of shares these blob data structures between different commits 
and you don't have to recreate blobs if they're already existing. So if there is a blob with some data and then there's a new commit created which uses that blob, it continues using the same blob. And that shows up like this. So now we can see that we created a new commit C2 and its parent is C1. And it also has a tree which has one file bar which has data two, and then also foo which was previously created. So it, just links to that older blob which is already existing. It doesn't create anything new. Uh, we'll now move on to a little more complicated uh, problem where what happens if you change this data? So let's say foo is already existing okay, and we uh, change the data. Pause <clears throat> real yeah. quick. There are a couple questions. One about um, the permissions for uh, in a tree for uh, each each blob. Or each entry entry um, are they the same as Linux permissions? Um, and then yeah, question about the object. Um, so is this about the the directory structure of yeah, the yeah. object folder? Yeah, I think that that's what it does. Yeah, yeah, that's when we can see this uh, the list of objects, and they all start with two uh, numbers or letters, and then we have the rest. Why, why we have split these two numbers? Yeah, that's a good uh, question. Uh, let me answer one by one. The first one said is the permission is it the same as the Linux permissions? Uh, as far as I know, yes. Uh, John, do you have more to add on this? I I think that's uh, it's answer. a li it's a limited subset. So yeah, yeah. for files, yeah, uh, six four four, and then for tr there's trees, um, right. and then there's one for uh, get sub modules. I think like a couple of others, but it's not as fine grained as the Linux yeah. permissions model. And I and I think it doesn't track the permissions, uh, such as what is uh, the user role and stuff like that. It's more about like right. what kind of object this is, and what is it executable or not. That's that's the kind of thing it uh, checks. And like John mentioned, if uh, we will also see this in future when we start creating subdirectories, which are trees, we will see how these changes for trees. Uh, we're not going into submodules, but yes, uh, submodules are also something. It's more of a special case in Git. Uh, so those are also treated as separate permissions. Uh, on to the next question. Why do we have two leading numbers uh, in the directory structure here? Uh, this is a good question, because uh, now we're dealing with something very small. This is a small repository. And you can see already with two comments that we've come up to like 10, seven files in total. So if you think about something like uh, GitLab, repository or the Git repository or the Linux repository, there are millions of uh, commits and uh, let's say Git objects which are being created. So that saturates the file system to some extent and also increases the seek time to get these files. So this is kind of a small trick that Git does, which kind of provides some sort of hashing to get your object. So this gets you the object directory and then uh, all the objects which start with 28 will be in this uh, directory. So that's 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 the in idea behind it. Why did they stick with two numbers? I'm not too sure about what the exact reason for two is. Uh, maybe it's just historic reason, but I, I, I'm not. If anyone has an answer to that, I'm happy to hear too. <laughs> Thanks. I think it's like the optimal number. It's enough to, to split yeah. it, but not very long, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I think you Question. need some uh, small number wherein you have enough collisions, like you mentioned, so other files would end up under this directory too. Uh, if you start giving more numbers at the start, you'd only end up with folders with just single files in them. So that's that's kind of where it is. Right. Uh, so now we will go into an example where we will modify one of these files to see what happens. Uh, so let's start with this one. So just to recap, we have two files right now. And uh, if you see both of those files, uh, one, uh, maybe this is easier. And yeah, so this is where we are at. Uh, so now let's modify the foo file with data three. So if you see git status now, it says foo is modified. And if you see git diff, it says it changed from data one to data three which is what we did. So we will add that. Uh, 
and we will commit it. Uh, all right. Mm. So now let's look at the same thing we did that time. We will look at the commit. Uh, so we did this. It shows the commit. It says there is a tree, and the parent is this. Let's just verify the parent, git log one line. And so this is the commit that we created, and the parent is this one, which makes sense. C3 is the new commit, C2 is this one. And uh, if we want to print the information regarding the tree, this should give us that. And if you see now that uh, there is a foo created here, uh, which is B5. But if you looked at the previous commit, which is one behind C2's tree, then the foo was different. So while bar stays the same, that's because the contents of the file bar didn't change. The contents of foo changed. So now there's a new object which is created for foo. And to verify this, let's just cat file. And I will print this one, which is the old one. And you can see that was data one, that was the old contents. And then this is the new one. And oh, come on, yeah, my copy paste is actually a little. Okay, right. So, and this is the new one, data three. And if you see the three objects from before, and then you can see that the new one, which is B5, also got added to the tree structure. Okay. That's, that's where we are. Uh, Going back to the diagram, now we have C2, which points to C1, and it also uh, and C3, which points to C2, and it also has a tree. While it holds the same uh, link to the blob bar, a new uh, blob for foo was created. I'm just putting this dash here to show that the new one was created. So the same file with different data. Uh, but what's interesting is that blobs are stored as entire data. So like. It didn't store the difference, which is data one. It didn't store this as the old blob minus one plus three, where you know it's some sort of delta. It, it instead stored the entire data. So that means that on a very loose object level, Git doesn't care about deltas for blobs. It just stores the whole blob. So if you have a file with 100 MB and then you create another file with 100 MB, it's going to store two of those. Uh, we will talk about in the future how there is mechanisms for deltafication in Git, but at this point, you need to know that uh, on the blob storage level, the files are stored with the entire data. Does that answer the last question? Uh, what happens with the blob when we modify a small section of a big file? I don't know who put that question, but hopefully that answers it. Yeah, yeah, so, so what Karthi was saying is, yeah, when they're loose files, when each blob is an individual file, um, Git just writes a new copy of of the blob, even if it's like a one-line change in like a 10,000-line file. Um, yeah. Later, when he talks about pack files, that's when uh, deltas come into the picture. So. Yeah, that, that's exactly. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, that's exactly uh, how it is. For now, you need to know that on the blob structure, Git is just going to store a different file. OK, so the, going on forward from here, I hope it's all clear till now. So we will move now to subdirectories and just show how Git handles now directories. Because right now, till whatever we saw, and all these tree structures we saw was simple because all the files are in the root directory. So bar and foo is in the root directory. The trees also show that there are two files. We don't care about subdirectories, and everything is right here. Uh, but moving on to subdirectories and how they work. So we create a simple directory. Uh, let's do this. We create a directory. What's interesting is Git doesn't say there's anything different in the uh, repository. Even though there's a new directory created, Git is not still worried about it. That's because at the base of it, Git only cares about files. Git cares about when you add files or remove files. Directories are more of a consequence of having files in a structure, but directories themselves do not matter to Git as much. Now, when you add data to a file within that directory, things start changing. That's because now there's a file that Git needs to track. And now if you see, it already starts showing it in status, saying that, hey, there's some new files in this folder we haven't tracked. 
but before this it wasn't even uh, talking about it because it, it there was no files to track and we can add this let's say git add abc slash bf and we'll finally commit it so just to give an idea we have four commits now and c4 is the latest one and uh, yeah, so like before, we'll do cat file and then we'll do git web. And this gives us the commit, and the commit says the parent is f242, which makes sense. And it has a new tree, which is 5aa338. And we can check this. And if you see now, there's an interesting concept here where the first two which is bar and foo, which are files, are stored at blobs. But then the tree also contains a subtree. And that's what ABC is. So let's see what this tree contains itself. So let's go here and let's print. Uh, okay. And now this tree contains a blob called F. What this means is that directories and subdirectories are nothing but trees in Git. So the base tree had two files, bar and foo, but it had another tree, abc, which is the directory abc. And that tree had a blob def, which is nothing but what is inside abc. I hope that makes sense. And if you look at the permissions also, it shows that there's a difference, like these two are blobs and this is a tree. Uh, this is what Git uses to denote trees. Uh, and looking at the diagram now, so we had three, and it gets a little complicated with here because now we have subtrees. So C4 is the new commit that we created, which has a top level tree, which points to one object, which is the foo, and the second object, which is the bar, which were pre existing objects. But it also created a new subtree which is ABC, which is the file part of that tree. And the, that tree has a, a blob, which is DEF with data code. I hope that makes sense. Uh, is there any questions in this section? Should I move on? I think we can move on. Yeah, makes sense. All right, uh, this is the final thing that I wanted to cover, which is basically what happens when files are moved. So now that we have ABC, what happens if we move it out? Like, let's say what happens to the file inside ABC when we move those files? So let's say we move, okay, this works. So now if you see git status, it said the file which was ABC slash DEF got deleted. And then there's a new file which is DEF. But when I do git add all of this, and if you do git status, it somehow recognized that the file which was existing, DEF, got moved from the folder ABC to DEF. And the clever thing to do would be that we keep this blob ID and just remove this tree and put it there. And that's kind of what Git does. Git realizes that the blob is the same, the DEF. And it, the only thing that changed was it got removed from this ABC folder, which was there existing. So it, instead of having a tree here pointing to ABC, it should now just put this blob directly. Because that's what, if you look at the structure now, there's ABC, which has nothing in it. But there's bar, def, and foo, which are three files. So when I do git commit and create a new one and git cat file, head, uh, show log, yeah. So the older commit of seven zero, and this is what it is. And we have a tree here. Let's print that tree. Yeah, and that's what it did. So now we have three blobs and no subtrees because there is no subtrees anymore. Although there is ABC here, and but because ABC is empty, Git doesn't care about it because Git only cares about files. And the current, as per Git is concerned, even if I do RMDIR ABC, it's the same. So if you see Git status, it, nothing changed. And if you see ls, bar, def, foo, these are the three files. And if you see the def here, uh, which got moved from ABC, but somewhere up here, yep, it has the same hash ID as the old one. That means Git can understand when files move. 
and it is smart enough to understand that hey since the file was existing and it already had a blob id i don't have to create a new blob with a new id and associate it instead i can just link it up and that's that's what this is and if you see this uh it says that commit 5 has a new tree but for the it doesn't have the sub directory abc tree instead directly points to def the blob df and the old two blobs which are foo and bar so that's kind of what is happening uh just going to give a moment for any questions on this section before i move on Like Sir Hill has a question. Do you just want to verbalize it directly, Sir Hill? Uh, yeah. So my question is, when this dev file was moved to a root directory uh, and we created new commit, does this old tree object stays, which uh, showed the that we have ABC directory and stuff like that? That's that's a really good question because it uh, gives us way into the thought process of Git about cleaning up of objects. Now, if you look at the tree structure here, this diagram rather, this tree is still usable. That is, if someone wants to go back to commit four, they need this tree to go back to commit four. So all objects in this diagram, which are reachable from the commits, will never get deleted. So that's kind of what Git does. Any object which is reachable will never get deleted. So Git has, if you know, it has a garbage collection which runs from time to time. I believe one of our training is also about housekeeping and how Gitly does it. But the gar to give you some uh, food for thought, there is that the garbage collection tries to clean up objects which are not required. But in our instance, all our objects are required because all of them are reachable. There could be a day tomorrow where someone says, I want to move back to commit three, or I want to move back to commit two. And they should have all the objects associated with that commit. So in this uh, graph structure that you have, anything which is reachable will always stay with the repository. Mm -hmm. So when does a good thought is when do objects get created, which could be deleted? Uh, but yeah, uh, we're not going to talk about that right now. I hope that answers your question, though. Yeah, cool. Thanks. All right. Uh, I think that's kind of a good uh, intro to how blobs, trees, and commits work. And I'm just going to show you that our uh, objects folder is just increasing with each of these things that we do. And if you see now, we have 16 files. Uh, but before we go into pack files, I just wanted to talk about the git folder. Uh, maybe just do ls git. So the git folder is mostly uh, a folder where git does most of the things. And these, as we already saw, uh, there are multiple folders here. Let me just go over each of these. Uh, I'm, First off is the branches folder. I've seen this exist, but I don't think it's used anymore. Uh, I don't know what historical reason it was created for. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone knows about this, maybe they could uh, enlighten us. But yeah, I will just skip that because I don't know what it is, <laughs> to be fair. Uh, yeah, so second up is uh, config. Config is simply where Git stores repository level configuration. So this is where you can do git config, say, change your email. Uh, I would say Karthik to new user at GitLab. And then you should see this in, yeah. So this is where all the repository level configurations stay. So there's a lot of options that Git provides. And I believe they have a web page stating all of these. You could probably go and check it there. But uh, yeah, so all configurations stay. And for the sake of this, I'm going to revert back to my right. And then uh, head, head. So again, let's do git ls. So we cover config. Next is head. Head is basically uh, something which points to which is the current commit that we are on. So if you looked at our previous diagram, we are on C5, and that's what it should be. So if you print head, it says. Yeah, so here it says, hey, I'm referring to something called as refs master, which is nothing but the branch master. So instead of directly saying I'm at this commit, it's saying I'm at this branch. 
And if I can print this branch, which is git refs adds master, that should hold this commit. And that is the commit we are at. So log one line, it's kind of what it is. So this is like a symbolic reference to another reference, which holds the actual value we are at. So if, for example, if I do git checkout, this is uh, at is the symbol, which is a shortcut for uh, uh, head or current commit that is. So if I do at tilde one, that means one commit previous. So if I do that, you can see now I'm at 7017, which is the previous commit. And we can cat. And now git points to 7017 instead of pointing to a branch, because none of the branches point to 70. Master points to uh, C5, which is here. Uh, so it directly points to this commit. So I will just check out back again. And now again, it points back to master, as simple as that. Uh, next, we go to index. Index is what happens when you, let's say you add a new file. Uh, to la, 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 la. And then if I do git add, this, this stage in git is called as the staging, where files are tracked uh, before they're committed. And this index is more of a staging uh, file, which says what are the files which are tracked and can be committed at any point. So if you try to print it, I believe it's in binary format. Yeah, it should be in binary format. but I think there is I had something over here. Yeah. So for index, yeah, similar to yeah. So this is if you do ls files stage, it shows what are the files which are being staged, and this is primarily the, the data which index holds, but it's in binary format, so we can't print it at this point. But this is kind of what it holds. I'm just going to remove this file. We are clear and. Let's move on to the next part. Uh, so next is logs. Uh, so Git kind of logs every step that you do. So this is kind of useful in debugging. Uh, so now, for example, if I do uh, anything here which uh, adds a commit or anything like that, Git tracks it. So let's just look at this log folder, which kind of gives us some headway into what other. So if you look at head, it says what are the different points that head was at. So if you saw that I moved from master to at one just a few minutes ago and then came back, it's kind of tracking all of that. The good part about this is you can do git checkout like I did that time. You can do git checkout some other commit. And then you can do git checkout dash, which is like go back to whatever I was before. And how git knows where you were before is because it has these logs. And finally, uh, with, there is also refs here, which also tracks like what what are the different stages that the, any branch you has well. This is mostly like uh, logging so that you can revert back to changes and get rid of problems that you have. So a good command to always use is reflog. So if you see git reflog, it shows you this log in readable format. This helps you like go back to different stages that you are. For example, if you're trying to do a merge and you fail and you just want to clear everything, you can always open the ref log, see where you are, and just like go git reset hard maybe to that point. So uh, moving ahead, uh, original head is uh, a it's kind of what Git uh, stores, similar to head, which is used for dangerous situations. Like, like I mentioned, like when you're doing merging or rebasing, and you end up in a scenario where something is broken, and original head at that point has the value of Git before you did those dangerous operations. So the idea was that you could always do something like Git reset and original head. So go, so you can go back to what was the state before you did something. Like uh, as far as I know, git merge and rebase are the only things which set these uh, set the original head. Uh, I'm going quickly over the next few ones. Commit message, edit message is the message that you have when you do a commit. It's stored so you, you can open a file editor and change this commit message. So I think the last one was C5 and it's just storing that, for example. 
description is what get used to store the description about the repository mostly people don't use this because they use git forges like gitlab uh, to store the repositories and gitlab has our own way of showing what a repository is about mostly through readmes or descriptions via gitlab uh, hooks is a uh, famous one so there are a lot of applications of uh, yeah so you want a lot of, to do a lot of things when git does certain operations so let's say once you want to before a commit is applied you want to do check let's say you have an npm uh, folder and you know want to run prettier on it to see if all the files conform to a standard and what you would do is you would write a hook which says right before the commit mess uh, commit is created please check that all files conform to the standard and that's the hooking mechanisms that git provides these are the different uh, stages of git that you can add a hook to and they have sample files here uh, basically you just need to create one with the same without the sample and make it an executable and you can hook into the git's life cycle via that uh, so that leaves us with info objects and refs objects we already covered uh, info Let's see what's inside info. Yes. Uh, info is, if I'm not wrong, it's metadata that Git uses to uh, do things, uh, certain things like having alternate uh, object storages. So uh, we're not going to go into alternate object storages, but the idea is that right now all of our objects are here in Git objects. But you can also have another folder outside somewhere which has certain objects. And you want to say, hey, some of the objects are here, some of the objects are in this alternate folder. And to know where are these different objects folders that you have, uh, the info folder is used. Uh, the, uh, moving on, uh, the git objects folder is, as we spoke about, all the objects that are part of this repository are in the objects folder. And finally, the refs are all the references, that is, branches and tags. Now that we know, understand how commits and trees work, References are nothing but pointers to those commits. So if you have a branch, let's say if I create a new branch, git check out branch new, it's nothing but pointer to the commit that we had. So if you see the log one line, we had five commits and new was pointing to this commit. And if I just go and see what git uh, refs, heads, 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 heads is the base for branch. So if you see new, it just points to that commit. And if you see similarly master, it just points that commit. And now since I'm on new, if I do reset new to, let's say two commits behind, and if I print new now, now new points to the older commit, which is C3, as simple as that. They just pointers to the commits that you had in the Git reports. And that's kind of the base of the Git folder, I believe. Uh, any questions here? All right. I, I also think we are on time. Uh, John, should we continue or? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We can just finish up. I mean, if folks have to drop, that's totally fine. We'll post yeah. the recording. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think one thing I wanted to cover, which was, uh, I think we covered branches and tags, which is basically how they work. Uh, tags are also similar. So if I do git, git tag and we create a new version, it's nothing but, again, a new pointer to some object. Uh, what you need to understand here is that now when you de start deviating, let's say uh, you have git you're on this new branch and you start creating echo one to one and let's uh, yeah branch one let's say we create this and similarly we create one more two and two and then we go back to master echo let's say three master one now if you look at log of master uh, maybe we look at both logs and graph yeah so 
So if you see here, what happened is that one C1, C2, C3 were common for both the branches. Uh, but master after C3 has C4, C5, and M1, which we created just now. Whereas new, which was created on top of C3, has B1 and B2. So new kind of deviated away from master at some point. So now it's still the same concept that uh, get if you print master, it points at 4, 4 at A1, which makes sense. And if you print new, it points at something else, C3. So there's still pointers to different commits. It's just that the commit tree that was there diverged at some point. So this goes back to the thing where we learned that all these objects will still remain because there are pointers which reference those objects. Now, the only time a cleanup could happen, for example, is when, let's say, the new branch gets deleted. Then no one is pointing to these two commits because right now new is pointing to this one, this one points to this one, and so on. Whereas if the new branch gets deleted, then no one points to these two commits. And that's when Git garbage collection, if it runs, we'll see that, hey, no one's pointing to these commits and they're there in the object directory. Let's delete those files. Right, uh, going on, we'll go to the last topic for today, uh, which is pack files. So we understood how all of these work. And now we have an idea about Git objects and how the object directory is. But a big caveat of this is these are called loose objects in Git terminology. So the big caveat of this is that all these objects that exist keep bloating up. Like as the repository keeps increasing, there's going to be a lot of objects, especially when there are single line edits like John mentioned. If there's a 10,000 line file and a single line gets modified, a new object is created. So you can see how quickly the repository size could bulk up because of this. So there was this idea that Git thought that, OK, let's, what if we put all these objects together inside one big file? And in that file, we store each object as a delta of another object. So that means now you get rid of things like uh, storing the whole, uh, let's say, file when there's only a single line change. So that's what pack, pack refs is. So pack, as the name suggests, the pack file uh, Format for Git is just nothing but it's packed file, where it has all these objects which are packed together into one file. And we can see that by simply right now. So yeah, so let's see all the objects that we have before we do anything. So Git cat file also has a bad check, which says print all the objects that are there, and it prints everything which is available. We'll also see how many objects we have, which is 26. And if we do tree.git objects, it should be similar, yeah. So there are 26 files right now. And you'll notice that there is a pack folder here. But if I do pack, there's nothing in that folder. So currently, we don't have any pack files. But we have 26 objects. And we can verify the same by cat file. So now we are going to do git gc, where uh, generally the garbage collection runs on particular heuristics. Whenever, let's say, you're doing a lot of pushes, pulls, or commits, it sees if those heuristics are met and it'll run it automatically. I'm manually running it so that it does the gar uh, garbage collection here. And now if you see, you can see that it did delta compression and it counted all the objects. And I believe, uh, yes, so it created craft objects and I will talk about what that is. Uh, so now if you see the, if you see the tree structure for Git objects, now two packs got created. So this is one set of packs, and this is the other set. The different uh, extensions differ to different thing that the pack file contain, uh, like uh, contains. I will talk about that in some time. But if you see, all of the objects got cleared. So all these objects that we had got put into pack files. So. Uh, now we can see what these pack files are. So Git provides a tool called verify pack, and we could see this. We could see Git objects pack, and let's see the first one, which is two eight something dot pack. Right. So this one contains these two objects only, and then let's see the next pack that we have which is 8C. This one contains these 22 objects. So uh, the idea is that it took all these objects together and put them in the pack file. 
so now the question is why do we have two different platforms and that's because git kind of tries and sees what are the objects which are uh, loose which is what it says scrapped which is no longer pointed by anything and it puts those in a packer which can be cleaned up later and the other objects which are have pointers to them and can be used at any particular point of time they are uh, put in the other packer that's that's the idea behind uh, packers i think yeah uh, any questions here i think yeah that should be enough is there anything else so uh, anyone thinks i should cover john what do you think yeah that was really good um i think that was pretty comprehensive of course <laughs> you could take any of those topics and do like yeah. a separate presentation on it but exactly. um i think we'll call it there i don't see any other questions um but uh so thank you karthik um that i think that was really helpful for a lot of us um I will uh, post this on our YouTube channel, uh, the recording. So, um, and then feel free to um, let let your um, team members know about this um, if they uh, want a. Um, I wouldn't say it's a basic primer, but yeah, a little bit in depth primer into Git and Git internals. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good day. Oops.